Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Awesome. Well, my name is Luke Hughes. I'm the adult discipleship pastor here at Midway. I also have the opportunity every once in a while to come up and teach and uh, talk about uh, the series and, and God's word. And I'm excited to get to do that with you guys today. Uh, we are in the second week of a series called Repeat the Sounding Joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Pastor Todd came last week and talked about joy to the world and how that refrain uh, brings us into all that Christmas is about. And now, to be fair, there was a rumor that went around last week that Christmas music isn't great, okay? I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm not uh, naming any Grinches. But um, I actually really love Christmas music. You know, yeah, okay, a few of us in the room. Yeah, you know, so there are different perspectives on that. But I, just, I, I enjoy, you know, it's, it's funny when you get around the Christmas season, when you get around the idea of Christmas, how we do things over and over and over again. We repeat the sounding joy, we resound these things. And a lot of that comes through in traditions or songs. And so I really like being able to sing songs that I don't have to have, you know, the lyrics to. It's because I've sang O Little Town of Bethlehem since I was like three years old. And so you just, you know the words and you can kind of sing along at any given time whether it's Bing Crosby or Shakira or Frank Sinatra. You know what I mean? Like you're just, you're singing along no matter what. And so there's a lot of comfort and uh, quality in being able to sing these songs that we all know and we all love. And then I, I started thinking about more Christmas traditions that, I, that I've had. And I remember uh, growing up, my mom's mom, so my grandmother, uh, we would go to her house and we would make homemade from scratch Christmas sugar cookies. You know what I mean? And so you get out the butter and the, and the sugar and the flour and you'd mix them all up and you'd bake them in the oven and then we'd pull them out and we'd decorate them with icing, Santa, reindeer, the whole shebang. And um, I can, you know, if I pause and I really think about it, I can smell those cookies still, you know? And I, I can taste what they taste like. And you know, you take them and you put them in one of those big old metal tins. It goes, you know what I mean, when you open it. And I just, I can remember certain things about Christmas from that thing, because we did it over and over and over again. And then I think, uh, you may think I'm weird, okay, but the one thing I do with uh, Christmas uh, a lot, I've done many years throughout my life, is I actually uh, go, and I have, a, I have a fake tree, this is important in a second. Um, I go and I lay underneath the Christmas tree. I know that sounds weird, but if you lay underneath it, maybe there's somebody in the room, somebody else that does it, but you kind of lay on your back up underneath the Christmas tree. You can kind of look up through the tree and it kind of creates this Christmas wonderland. You know what I mean? You're like, one, you're seeing your tree from a different perspective and you're looking up, you can see all the ornaments. I make David do it, you know, come lay down and look up through, and I know you guys will send me pictures all this week of like random people laying underneath your tree looking up. But yeah, it's kind of like Christmas meditation. You know what I mean? You're kind of there, you're just kind of like breathing and it, it kind of, it brings the world in. It's, it's, a, it's a cool experience. It gets me in the, the Christmas spirit. And my brother-in-law the other day was like, oh, you know, that's really awesome that you used to, to do that as a kid. And I was like, yeah, I did it yesterday. You know, because there's something about traditions and doing things over and over again that, that is powerful. But I, I think that something draws us to Christmas or, or to the end of the year or to, or to the holiday season because it's in these moments that we have at least the opportunity, whether we engage in it or not, to reflect. It gives us a, a, a moment to slow down. And what's interesting about that is, I don't know where or what stage of life or what space you find yourself in. You may be younger and Christmas may be all about going home, you know what I mean, and being a part of family traditions. Or you may be older and you may have lost someone that was important to you and, and the holidays have some um, melancholy or bittersweetness that come along with them. But, but whatever season or stage of life that you're in, it's funny how the holidays, the, the end of the year Christmas, brings about these moments of, of reflection and questioning and thinking about things you may not always think about. Things that you may find uh, bring stuff up out of your soul and out of your spirit. 
that, that you may find brokenness or disappointment or, or something bubbling up, the, the cracked parts of our soul and our heart and, and our life can have space to begin to breathe when we're not running around distracting ourselves. And what's interesting, I think, is for many of us, one big question, one big revelation, one thing that we struggle with time and time and time again that we may not even realize is driving and moving our lives forward in such an impactful way is a question that uh, we engage with that whether you overtly talk about it or not is so important. And it's this idea of what is God's perspective of me? See, have you ever really thought about that question? Because a lot of your life, I would say, not just your theology, not just your religion, not just the way you approach God or church or life in general, but that question is answered because you live your life in a certain perspective and direction based on those assumptions. And and so for many of us in the room, the, the way we view God is actually affecting our reality regardless of if we admit it or not. And, and what's so interesting is I, I think we all have a vision of what he or what that looks like. You, you may see an old man with a long, white, scraggly beard, you know, and he may be grumpy like that neighbor that will never throw your ball back into the yard, you know what I mean? You're kind of like scared to talk to him or see him at the mailbox because he always has something negative to say. Or, you know, like it could be a hippie, you know, like that's all about love and feelings and peace, man. you know what I mean? And whatever your view of, of God is, that, that affects, the, you know, you may see him as a loving parent, you may see him as a distant parent, you may see him as someone who doesn't care or, or someone that's all about the rules, a lawyer, well, whatever your view of God is, It's affecting your reality in a way that changes the way you live out your life. And see, what's so interesting is many times we engage with that question, but I don't think we ever get to a place where we say, does God actually have something to say on his own behalf about how we should view him? And the the great interesting thing about the Christmas story, the great interesting thing about the the passage that we're looking at today in uh, this passage about shepherds and and God announcing to the shepherds a new story and good news is that we have the unique opportunity, the unique moment to, to see God speak in such a powerful way as to what he would desire each one of us to see and value about him. And so if you're here this morning and you're wondering, well, what does God think or what is God like or what does God think about me? This passage offers an opportunity to see something that he may value you to see in himself. So if you have your copy of God's word, you can open up to Luke chapter two, phone, book, whatever you have, Luke chapter two. And we're gonna start in verse Eight, Luke chapter two, verse eight. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. They were keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will be a great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The first thing I want you to see today is this, that the announcement of who Jesus is changed everything. That the announcement of who Jesus is changes everything. So, so you have this group of random shepherds, right? And, and, now I, and I can just tell you, uh, really when it comes to shepherding, it hasn't really changed much in the last several hundred years, okay? The main objective is still the same. Go watch the sheep and make sure they don't die, 
Okay, same, same objective, hundreds of years later. And, and, and really, in and around that area in uh, Bethlehem and, and those areas uh, in Israel, there are shepherds that still do this job on a regular basis. In Palestine and all these other areas around there, the shepherds follow along, you know, and they keep sheep going in the direction they need to be going. And, and so shepherding, even now, is not a coveted position. You know, the, it's not like Shepherd's College out there somewhere. They're like, you're really, like, you just either kind of know the business and, and get into it, but it's a, it's a very simple job. And, and what's interesting is, is all of a sudden to these shepherds, and, and now, like, don't miss the key feature of, like, shepherding. Like, shepherding is about, like, you know, you probably smell like sheep, and, and, you, and you spend a lot of your nights and days out in the cold and in the hot. And like outside of, especially, you know, I guess now you can watch YouTube while you're doing it, but like for the most part, it's, it's all the same. Same as it was hundreds of years ago. To these people, all of a sudden, the angel of the Lord appears. The angel of the Lord appears. Now, his description is kind of right there in his name, right? The angel of the Lord, the mouthpiece of God, comes to speak to these shepherds. And not only does the angel of the Lord appear to these guys, all of a sudden it says right there in the passage that the glory of the Lord shone down upon them. And so on this random hillside in the middle of Bethlehem in the dark, there is this massive light and this massive voice and presence of the angel of the Lord as it comes to declare in this moment. And now this language is very loaded. This language is loaded from the Old Testament because one, the very presence of the angel of the Lord means that God is there and present in this moment. But two, the, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of God that has come and alighted on this hillside in Bethlehem belonged in the temple. See, when Solomon first dedicated the temple to God up in Jerusalem on the temple mount, the Glory of the Lord, we're told, comes in and rolls in like a, a heavy smoke and heavy fog and, and comes and fills the, the Holy of Holies so that the people of Israel would know that God was forever with them. Later on, the prophet Ezekiel, when Babylon comes in and captures Israel, they, uh, he sees the Shekinah glory of the Lord leave the temple. It gets taken up and, and disappears and, and removes itself from the Holy of Holies. And so the, whole, the holy presence, the glory of the Lord is taken from the people of Israel. And then all of a sudden, it reappears. But where should it reappear? Not in the Holy of Holies, not on the Temple Mount, but in the very strange backwater hillside in the middle of Bethlehem. And the angel of the Lord starts to speak. And, and you know, like these shepherds, they're probably not like super educated guys, but they get it. Like God shows up, all I've heard my entire life is I die. And so they're thinking, Joey, this is our time, man. You know, me, you, and the sheep, we're gone. You know, we're goners. This is the, this, we thought it was going to be better than this. But nope, this is how it all ends. And so they're here in this moment, and, and this, this thing begins to happen. But the angel of the Lord says something specifically to these guys. It says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And, and see, this language, it's there to communicate something. The gospel writer wants us to understand something in this moment. That see, in the town of David, that, that this is of the line and of, of the structure of David, that, that this this has something to do with the blood of warrior kings flowing through both David, Solomon, Saul, these guys that were the history and the tradition of Israel that in the town of David, from the line of David, the root of Jesse is coming this person. Not only that, he's, he's the savior. As in, you are slaves and, and now it's time to be set free. It's time for a, a new exodus. You're, you're coming into this new place that he's the savior but not only is he the savior, he's, he's Messiah. He's the anointed one. So he's both priest and king, that he's, he's coming to set aright anything that is wrong with the temple. And so he's gonna change it from the inside out. But not only that, he's, he's Christ. He's the Lord Christ. He's the one 
you've been waiting for. Line of David, Messiah King. But then they say something peculiar. And this will be the sign of that warrior king who has finally come. You will find him as a baby, wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And now see, don't get me wrong. Don't, don't miss this moment. Because first, the, the very angel of the Lord and the very holy presence of God comes to the wrong people. Right? Don't get me wrong. Like, Shepherds were low men on the totem pole. And even though they're kind of respected in the Bible, like they still smell like sheep, right? And so like, if you're gonna announce a warrior king who's finally come, you don't go to the sheep smellers. You know what I mean? Like you don't, like you linger of sheep, sir. You know what I mean? And so it's the wrong people. And then it happened in the wrong place that the glory of the Lord began to show down on this random hillside. It could have been any hillside. Nobody knows really scholarly, like where it is out there. It could have been that one or that, the wrong place. And it was communicating the wrong message. Oh, because this is great. He's from the line of David. He, he's the savior and he's the king. And how, where should we find him? Well, we're gonna go find him in Herod's palace. He's gonna be clothed in splendor. He's gonna have a sword already attached to his hip. No, 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 no. He's across town in a stable, sitting in a feeding trough, covered in the rags of the poor. It's the wrong people, it's the wrong place, and it's the wrong message. And it has all the makings of a uh, failed gender reveal. You know what I'm talking about? You have, I got sucked into a YouTube hole this week, okay? And, and we, I just got on these, these gender reveal moments, right? Because it's supposed to be all happy, you know what I mean? It's like this, this moment where like you find out, and just, it's, it's amazing how these things can go wrong. So I, I just, in, in honor of the almost failed birth announcement of Jesus, we're just, we're gonna watch some uh, of these painful moments together, okay? I call this first one, I call this first one, husband cares too much for only a second. Husband cares too much for only a second. Got her. Now notice what he checks on first. <laughs> Kids don't know the sex of the baby yet. All right, yes, yes. I call this second one the inevitable outcome. The inevitable outcome. All right, I'm recording right now. Thanks, Granddad. Tom, you need to be in there. Oh. I told you I had to have two of them hanging at a time. And they, and they never found out. What this, this is. But to be fair, if my brother was coming at me with a massive needle towards my face, I would let the balloon go too. This, this last one is um, what I would call uh, joy for a moment. Uh-huh, 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 oh, yeah. <laughs> Got him. Every husband has experienced that in some way, metaphorically or otherwise. See, the, the thing is, it just came off as, 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 as broken, as flawed. As, this, this isn't right. But the, the problem was... It, even though for these people and the people involved, it felt like it was at the wrong place. And it felt like it was with the wrong people. And it felt like it was the wrong message. God was doing something altogether different than what they thought was happening. See, the announcement changed everything. See, the announcement changed everything. Things were not what they expected and things were not as they suspected. That the God, that, that Jesus was, was coming in a way that would value and shift and change and turn the world on its head. And see, that's the great thing in this moment when you're like, oh no, this is about to get really awkward. Someone's about to get blasted by a powder cannon. 
The unthinkable happens, right? That validates and exonerates this moment. All of a sudden, into this moment of awkwardness, suddenly, verse 13, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, Peace to those on whom his favor rests. See, the second point is this. We must embrace the change the announcement brings. The angel said, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. It's this powerful refrain, this powerful chorus, but it's also an invitation Because see, the angels appear and they start saying, glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest. And and, and we understand this, right? Because God is powerful. God is almighty. God is strong and, and has every resource at his fingertips. And so obviously, glory to God in the highest heaven. But you see that this refrain, this chorus, this repeated thing is, it's also an invitation because not only is it glory to God in the highest, but it's peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests. And who does his favor rest on? It says it right there when it says, listen, I bring you tidings of great joy for all people, all people. My favor rests on all people. Now, why? Because the announcement changed everything. But the thing we have to wrestle with is, does, do we embrace the change the announcement brings? Because see, what God invites us into is a new way of seeing who he is. See, Jesus, we would think, went to the wrong people with the wrong message at the wrong place. But for God, it was exactly where and when and what he wanted it to be. Because see, listen, glory to God in the highest heaven. Why? Because a little babe of flesh and blood has been born a mile or two away in a cold, dark stable. And this is how I choose to reveal myself to you. John says it this way. He came and he tabernacled, made his tent, made his dwelling, sat shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, breath to breath with us so that we would know that he had come close. So glory to God in the highest heaven. Why? Because God has all power and riches. No, but because there is now peace offered to those on whom his favor rests. Shalom peace. The kind of peace that takes brokenness and makes it complete again. Takes lives that are shattered and puts them back together. What does God want to be championed in? Glory to God in the highest heaven because peace is now offered through a baby, through a new way, through a change, and it is announced to all those on whom his favor rests. See, I I think if you're like me, sometimes we struggle with with our views of God. That we think... that God is the great beard haver and rule follower. And that what God desires more than anything is to erect a fence between you and me so that he can keep you out because you are a sinner and you are broken and you are dirty. And any legislation I can come up with to keep you removed from me, I'm gonna use to make sure you end up in your rightful place, which is hell. But see, what God is telling us in this announcement is this. The thing that brings me the most glory, glory to God in the highest, is participating with the peace I offer to bring and put your lives back together again. I don't remain in heaven. I come to earth as one of you. And see, it's interesting because if you're like me, you, you may struggle with personalizing this change. Because see, it's one thing, the announcement changed everything, but do we embrace the change the announcement brings? Because see, it changes your standing with God when you realize that God wants more than anything for you to draw close. Peter, one of Jesus' leaders and, and followers, later on, he, 
he struggles with this moment. It's about five chapters into the story of Luke. He finds himself in this repetitious moment, this re- resounding moment. Peter and Jesus have met a few times and they've hung out by the lake and, and they're really kind of like getting to know each other. They're both staying in the town of Capernaum and, and that's where Jesus has made his headquarters. That's where Peter's family lived and he would put out from there and fish. And this is one of those days where he's just gotten back from fishing. Peter and, and uh, James and John and, and those guys would go out and they'd fish at night and they'd put in a port in the morning, clean out their nets. And I just imagine that Peter and John and those guys are cleaning their nets and who is this guy that comes out in the early morning but Jesus and starts teaching on the side of the sea and they're listening. And this is where the story picks up in Luke chapter five. It says, when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. But then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed him. And, and what's so interesting and in telling about this story to me is that Peter finds himself in, brought into a new announcement, brought into a, a, a change. The, the world is shifting around him and Jesus is put out into the water. He's like, you don't know anything about fishing, but, but you seem to be a pretty wise guy. And so I'm gonna do what you asked me to do. I'm gonna obey where you asked me to obey. And all of a sudden, God shows up in this mighty and this powerful way. And, and Peter's sitting here in this moment of reality and, he, and he's looking around and he's saying, no, 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 Jesus, you don't get it. You're too good for me. You're too powerful for me. You're too loving for me. You're too patient. All I'm gonna do is mess up the plans that you have. Jesus, don't you get it? I'm just a simple, sinful fisherman. Depart from me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. But, but did you catch what Jesus says back to him. It sounds a a lot like what was said to simple, sinful shepherds. Peter, don't be afraid. You're right, Peter. I'm more patient than you. I'm more loving. I'm more obedient. I'm stronger than you could possibly imagine. Faithful through and through. But don't be afraid. Because I'm inviting you close. You are gonna participate in the mission. See, listen, Peter, Peter, don't be afraid. You are enough. I I want you, Peter. You're gonna fish for people, Peter. I believe you can do it. I'm calling you in and things are gonna be altogether different because I'm changing things. The announcement changes things. But Peter, there's one thing you gotta start to get through and in your heart that not only is the announcement changing things, but you've gotta embrace the change that the announcement brings. And in that moment, Peter said, oh, and he left everything, and he followed him. Because listen, listen, listen. God invites you close. He's changed the rules because glory to God in the highest and peace on those to whom his favor rests. You can have peace. See, God is more for you than you will ever be for you. God is more loving towards you than you will ever desire and love yourself. And if you desire to find God, he desires to find it more for you. Because God is drawing you in, calling you home. But see, 
it sounds great, right? And you think, oh man, that, you know, it's such a beautiful picture and, and it, it makes sense for other people, but you don't understand the things that I have done. You don't understand the brokenness that I've been through. You don't understand the, the, the moments of failure that I've had, the moments of selfishness that I've had. And I was struck by this because I can, I can understand how, it, how we fail to personalize and understand that, that God isn't just talking about stuff, that God isn't just talking about others, that God is talking to you. In this seat, that heart, this family. And I was reminded, I've been... I started reading a book about two weeks ago. It's uh, called The Return of the Prodigal Son by a guy named Henry Nowen. And he's a, a priest and he was a professor at Harvard, taught theology for many years. And so his um, book that kind of shifted his life in the later years is called The Return of the Prodigal Son. And so it's a moment where uh, Henry Nowen has with uh, the prodigal son's story, the parable that Jesus tells. But also in uh, lieu of that, he runs into a painting of the prodigal son by Rembrandt. And so it's actually these two elements, both the painting and the story, that really kind of shifts his perspective and his thought throughout the book. But I was struck by a moment of challenge in the book. And so I, I didn't know how familiar you were with the actual painting of the prodigal son by Rembrandt. And so I, I have it here just so you, kind of as a reference so that you guys can see it. And so you have the father, uh, obviously there in the red cloak, and the son there in front. And then it's a little bit harder to see, but the older brother is kind of off there to the right. And then there are these three other other individuals, uh, the last one is the least easy to see, but it's in the back left corner of the father's shoulder. And so there's four other individuals. One of them is the, the older son. And so this is the prodigal son by Rembrandt. And so most of us are probably familiar with the story of the prodigal son that there were these two brothers and they had a loving father. And one of the younger brother came to the loving father and said, hey, listen, what I want is my inheritance, Okay. What I want is what I um, deserve from you. And so just give me my half of the inheritance and I will go and, and be free finally of your tyrannical reign and rule. And I will do what I want to do and I will be my own man. And so the, the younger son takes his half of the inheritance from his father, takes off into a, a faraway country and lives uh, lavishly and vicariously however he wants to live. And we're told that he spends all of the money and realizes he's poor. And about the time he spent all the money, of course, the market crashes and he finds himself having to get a job, right? And so he goes to a pig farm and he gets a job and he's not like uh, lead scrum master of the pigs, right? He's like uh, the feeder of the pigs. And so he's slopping the pigs and I'm sure he's probably dealing with the back end work on that too. But he finds himself in this horrible position and it says in the scriptures that he longed to fill him, himself with, with what the, the pigs were eating. So he obviously wasn't eating very well. But in this moment, it says in the story that he came to his senses. He came to his senses. He realized, oh, my father's servants, the people that work for my dad, they live a much better life than I live. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pack everything up and I'm going to go home. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell my dad, surely he can't deny me this, that I'll go to my dad and say, listen, I'm so sorry. I don't deserve to be your son anymore. But if you'll just hire me on as one of your hired hands, that will be enough for me. And so I'll repent, I'll, I'll say I'm sorry, and, and, and maybe he will have the mercy to put me on as one of his hired hands. And so he starts heading home. In the story, you have this moment where you see the father sees him a long way off, and he starts running to his son. He takes off headed towards his son, and so he runs up to his son. In this moment, the son starts going through the, the script that he's rehearsed. He says, okay, dad, I'm really sorry. Uh, I don't deserve to be in this family anymore. Uh, if you could just hire me on. And it says that the father just stops in mid-sentence and calls out to the servants and says, okay, listen, bring the family ring and put it on his finger. Bring the, the family robes and throw them over his shoulders. Go and kill the, 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 the fatted calf and, and prepare a feast in his honor. Because listen, my son that was dead, he has come home. Listen, you're not a halfway son. You're not a partway son. You're not a partway family member. You're not a halfway daughter. You have come home and you are just my daughter. You are just my son. And you've come home. And, and that's what matters. You've come home. And you're safe, and you're saved, and you're sound. And so you have this moment that Rembrandt depicts. And Rembrandt, the, re the reason he's known as one of the, like, the master painters is because of his use of light and dark. 
And so he's very intentional in the way he sets up and shades uh, the paintings that he works on. And so obviously you see this painting and the emphasis of the painting is this, the moment of heavy light, the, the place where you find the most emphasis in the light is the father and the son. And you have the son wrapped up in the father's embrace and he's looking down lovingly at him and he finds himself in a place of vulnerability down near the feet. You can see his, he's basically worn through his shoes and he's, and he's laying there in the father's arms and the father's just embracing him. And, but what's so telling to me is that there's also these other four individuals in the photo. And they're just watching in the painting. And they all have different reactions. I know it's hard to see from where you're seated. You can go look it on Google Art Project later and, and see each of the faces. But they all have a different distinct expression as to how they're reacting to the moment. Because they all have baggage that they're bringing into this moment. They all have thoughts and opinions and views about what's happening in this moment. Some of them are happy, some of them are, are contemplative, some of them are judgmental, but they all come into this moment and see this moment. And I know this is gonna be kind of trippy, okay, but, but I kind of want you to go with it for a second. They're, they're observing this moment, and they're all thinking about it. But we're doing the same thing. So it's almost like we're a part of the painting. Because see, each of you is, is looking at this moment. It's the way the painting is designed. It's the, the centerpiece of the moment is this in, in thrown, in, encased in light. There's this, this moment between a father and a son and the loving embrace and the welcoming home uh, of a son. And just like there's four people in the background in the shadows seeing this moment, you are looking at and observing this moment. And this is the challenge that Henry Nouwen brought. He, he looks at this painting and he says this, how often do I relegate myself to being the person that sits and observes this moment when all God is calling me to do is in my vulnerability and my need to go and kneel before him and be embraced? Because see, you and I will sit for years in our lifetimes and observe this moment, but the beauty and the power of what Jesus is saying in the prodigal son, what God is announcing here on a hillside in Bethlehem, what Rembrandt is trying to capture in oil and in paint is this, you, 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 you must come and kneel before the Father and find his loving embrace. Because listen, the announcement changes everything, but the announcement has to change you. And so will you relegate yourself to observing or will you experience the grace? Will you be welcomed home? Because that is what God desperately wants for you. As we wrap up, the last point I want you to see is this. Accepting the announcement invites a response. Accepting the announcement invites a response. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. See, the, the shepherds come, they go, okay, well, we've got to go see this, this new thing, this change, this announcement that has changed everything. And, and they go and they find across a, a town Mary and Joseph and this little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. And, and, and what happens next is just so beautiful because when we run into God who has changed our mind and shifted our perspective and brought our lives into the realization of all that we were created and purposed to be, it invites a response and changes the nature of who we are. And so the shepherds 
shepherds leave and they go, listen, listen, listen. Hey, dude, hey, random guy, come here, come here, come here. You, I know this is gonna sound crazy, but the Savior, the Messiah, the King of the world is here. He's not over there in Herod's palace. He's over there hanging out with Mary and Joseph in a stable and he's just wrapped in, in little poor people's clothes. And you, could, and you can go see him right now if you wanna go see him. Why? Because everything had changed. Everything's different than what we expected. And so when we accept the announcement, it invites a response. It invites a response. See, God calls you close. And when he calls you close, it changes everything because glory to God in the highest. See, glory to God, why? Because he's got all the fame Nah. Glory to God in, in the highest because he has all power. No. Glory to God in the highest because for him it comes in offering peace to all on whom his favor rests. Which brings us back to the point of Christmas. Right, because Christmas, we get all these repetitious things done. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy. Resound, resound, resound. And this repetition happens over and over again. And do you know why it's powerful in our lives? I'll tell you. Same with my son, David. We're in this phase right now where like David sits in the back seat and, and you know, and, and he goes, we get to the end of a song and he goes, again, please. Again, please. I'm like, David. I don't want to listen to Part of Your World by the Little Mermaid for the 800th time. He's like, again, please, daddy, please. Okay, look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you say? And we play it over and over and over again. But do you know why we play it over and over and over again? It's because David now knows every word of that song. I told David, hey, you know, you could be like a PhD in the names of Santa's reindeer, because he's just like, you know, I can't even say him now, but like Comet, Dancer, Donner, Blitz, you know, he just, because he's listened to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer 10,000 times. And listen, we as individuals, we as human beings, we leak this story. God wants you to know that everything's changed, but we leak that change. We start to think, oh God, all you care about is the rules. Oh God, do you even see me? Oh God, don't you feel my pain? Oh God, what's going on? I feel so numb right now. And God wants to repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Glory to God in the highest. And peace, peace, completeness, healing, shalom to all those on whom his favor rests. But see, it's gone from great fear to great joy because to you a child is born to you a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and you will call his name Emmanuel which means God with us See, God doesn't care what you think he should be. God wants you to know all in all, most of most, that he wants you to know who he thinks he should be in your life. And he doesn't wanna lord it over you. He doesn't wanna overpower you. He wants to come as Emmanuel to you, to dwell with you, to heal you from the inside out, not so that he could crush you, but that he could turn you into all that you were meant to be, all that you were meant. And this brings great, high glory to him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Today in this room, there may be people who need to repeat the sounding joy. That you have leaked all that God has said you are and all that you should be. Child, not a half child. Born again, bought by his son's precious blood. 
You are a son and a daughter of the king. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. See, it is new over and over again because we leak it and we need to live into it. If that's you this morning and you need to repeat the sounding joy, would you just raise a hand so I can pray for you? If you're here this morning and you feel like you have leaked the identity that God has called you to, that that you are finding yourself, just raise your hand up high so I can see it. I just wanna pray and encourage you. That's you this morning. All right, I see those hands. You can put them down. Jesus, there are those of us that are living for less than what you have called us to. May the words and the sounds and the things that we hear this week be your great love and affection for us. Bring peace in our lives. Peace that makes us trust you more, to be obedient more, to lean into all that you desire for us to be more. To your name I pray. Amen.